This is a reading from Akita, the Tears and Message of Mary. <clears throat> Chapter 13, A Requested Sacrifice. Sister Agnes lost her hearing on the 16th of March, 1973. For a time, after the morning call, she did not speak to anyone and was not aware of the abnormal state of her ears. When the telephone rang about 6.30 in the morning, the sound had seemed somewhat distant. When she took up the phone, she could hardly distinguish the voice at the other end. A sister was calling from the mother house of Akita. Then suddenly she was again plunged into that world of silence. The events which followed during the next 10 years, little by little, opened her eyes to the profound meaning of this trial, which was the work of divine providence. At the moment it happened, it was like a catastrophe for her and forced her to leave the catechetical service which had been going so well and to come and take refuge in this place of peaceful prayer lost in the fullness of nature. At that time, the community was small and rarely received visitors. All the sisters were of one heart in prayer and daily work. When Sister Agnes took up her work of sewing in her own room, she joined a prayer with each movement of the needle, never detaching her thoughts from the Lord. Thus, without her being aware of it at all, her faith was being purified in the crucible of trial and her heart invited to the greatest intimacy with the Lord in order that she might become a pliable instrument, capable of receiving the messages of Mary. The series of events which we have traced in the previous pages and the message which is at their heart began shortly after Sister Agnes became deaf. The importance of this trial was underlined by Our Lady in her first words, Is your deafness painful to bear? You will be cured, be sure. Be patient. Pray in reparation for the sins of humanity. These simple words conceal an entire instruction. What are we searching for in, our, uh, in life, in our time, whoever we are? It can, it can be summed up in two words, temporal happiness. One finds a reason for living in the pleasures of the world. One lives for diversion, leisure, an easy life, to such a point that one sees in work only the means of obtaining leisure. The search for pleasure for the body, the banishment of pains and anguish of the spirit become the ultimate ends of life. And when these conditions cannot be realized, it is common practice to brandish slogans of social justice or respect for the rights of man while declaring war on other men. Carried on the wave of contemporary fashion, Christians have more and more difficulty living the faith as a total offering to God, of offering the sufferings and sacrifices of each day in reparation for sins, an offering nevertheless inherently necessary to the economy of salvation. Certainly, it is not easy to remain serene and to withhold oneself entirely from the influence of the overwhelming flood of materialism which seems to carry all before it. Even when one clings to the Catholic faith and tries to live it with help with the help of grace, one does not accept the least suffering or the least effort if these are not paid for in some way by a temporal satisfaction. The old proverb, no good without pain, seems to be effaced from our memories. To bear moral pain and physical suffering in a spirit of offering and of love for God, patient acceptance of his will, is an attitude long since relegated to the museum of alien follies of religion. When one looks at the cross from this angle, one can easily understand the disposition of the crowds laughing at this pure sacrifice of expiation. If you are the Messiah, come down from the cross and save yourself. Those of us who live following the tastes of our time do we not, in a certain way, take up this insulting cry of the crowd? Dazzled by the needs of the world, do we forget the needs of the kingdom and forget to look for the divine will? We do not like the sacrifices asked of us and seek by every means to avoid the efforts which come our way. And if we hook on to the little happiness of the moment, do we not finish by making it a reason for being alive one day to the other and lose our true sense of the Christian religion to which we ought to uh, we, we thought ourselves attached. In this perspective, the trial of the deafness which affected Sister Agnes, even if the causes were natural, merits that we study it with special attention. We have already spoken of the details of her miraculous cure, cure, although provisional, which took place on the 13th of October, 1974. This cure had been announced on the 18th of May. Let us consider again the angel's words. Your ears will be restored in August or in October. You will hear, you will be healed, but that will last for only a moment because the Lord still wishes this offering 
and you will become deaf again. And seeing that your ears hear again, the heart of those who will still doubt will melt, and they will believe. Have confidence and pray with good intentions. Later, in the message of September 22nd, the angel described in detail the circumstances in which the cure would take place. Then she adds in order that Sister Agnes might understand well that this will be provisional. Your ears will hear for only a certain time. They will not be completely healed. You will become deaf again. The Lord still wishes this offering. When we realized that Sister Agnes had really been cured, we were amazed and we all expressed to her our sincere joy. But this was, despite everything, mitigated because we knew that if her ears had been healed in the way predicted, they would be also closed again. And one could not help but wonder with a certain anxiety, as she did, just how long it would last. One had the impression that this might be shortly afterwards, and putting things in the best light, one could also think that the delay, the delay would be shorter even than hoped for. On Thursday, the 6th of March, 1975, I was in the process of transporting an enormous stone of several tons with the help of four workers, which I had chosen for the Garden of Mary. We were moving it by sled on the snow. Towards midday, hearing the voice of a sister who called me from the convent, I ran, thinking it must be the telephone, only to learn that the statue of the Virgin was weeping. It had not wept since the 4th of January, two months before. I hastened to the chapel in my work clothes, and when I was close to the statue, I saw that the wood was wet near the feet, and that a drop remained on the bottom of the chin. While I was noting this, the bishop arrived, and saying that one could not be sure without touching it, he gathered the drop on his index finger, where it shone, visible to the eyes of all. At this precise moment, one heard the noise of a taxi arriving at the entrance of the convent, and there was the journalist from Catholic Graph. Not wishing to let pass such an opportunity, he hastened to take out his camera, but the photo showed nothing because the tears had just stopped. If I had not recalled this incident before, it is because there was nothing else in particular except that it was the first lacrimation after the three which took place on January the 4th. However, it was from this day that Sister Agnes began to experience violent headaches without anyone at first knowing. During the Mass of the first Friday of the month, and on the first Saturday, it redoubled in intensity to the point that she remained prostrate, holding her neck in her hands after communion. She refused to come for breakfast and kept her prostrate position without moving. Later, she came to me and said, I no longer hear anything as the angel had predicted. The angel looked at me with a compassionate air and said, Support that until the time willed by the Father, and then disappeared. Sister Agnes had a presentiment on the previous evening with a headache. She relates that it was the same nature, that it was of the same nature as the headaches with which she was assailed before her first deafness. It was not only a feeling of heaviness, but she felt oppressed as if one had placed a steel pot over her head, with a deafening roar which resounded as though in a tunnel or near a jet plane taking off. I took her the same day to the municipal hospital of Akita and to the specialist of the Hospital of the Red Cross. The municipal hospital delivered the following medical certificate. One must fear a brutal lowering of hearing in both ears. First consultation, 7th of March, 1975. Must observe relative rest and undergo a treatment for the moment. Signature. The Red Cross Hospital gave the following diagnosis. Bad hearing of both ears. Annex. Following the fall of auditive faculties, the level of perception had been null, even in regulating the apparatus to the maximum. A regaining of the auditive faculties in the future is highly improbable. I certify the above date and signature. Thus, Sister Agnes found herself plunged into a world, cut off from all sound from this day on, as it happened two years before. And what is more, the doctors declared incurable after having submitted her to minute examinations. However, as the angel had declared, you will not hear for a certain time. You will not yet be completely cured. It was permitted to hope that she would be cured definitely one day, and all hope was not lost. Moreover, the angel had encouraged her to accept this with patience until the time willed by the Father. None of us knew the day nor the hour, but all hearts were united in prayer, strengthened with a new hope. 
it is fitting that we should take again take up our reflection on the meaning of the mysterious events concerning the statue. We have already seen that a miracle is never given without a spiritual reason. Magicians do their tricks to astonish spectators, but God does not turn over the laws of nature for the pleasure of amazing men. Why the blood, the sweat, the perfume, the hundreds and the hundred and one times that the statue wept? We have already said that these signs were given to verify the supernatural character of the messages, messages given through the intermediary of the statue, and of ears mysteriously closed, and then miraculously opened, closed again, with the promise of a final cure. To sum up, we can say that the first message is a greeting and encouragement addressed to the sister. The second is an invitation to sacrifice and prayer, offered to appease the anger of the father. Finally, the third is a warning against eventual chastisement and an exhortation to confidence in our mother in heaven. And perhaps the following word, words of the second message constitute the essential of the entire message. Many men in this world afflict the Lord. I seek souls to console him, to appease the anger of the celestial father. I seek with my son souls who repair by their suffering and their poverty for sinners and ingrates. Many men in this world afflict the Lord. One could say that in the actual state of the world, one could say that the actual state of the world is such that it appears to be the contemporary version of the way of the cross made by the Savior. In our day, there is practically no man who has not heard speak of Christ. One knows his name. One has met him in one way or another. And does not the great contemporary mass have the same attitude towards him as the Jews of 2,000 years ago, there was no one to console the Savior. One is, above all, preoccupied with consoling oneself. Can one hear anything other than shouts of injury and of mockery? I seek souls to console the Master. What a poignant appeal. Are we not being asked, if we wish to console the Master, to run to his help on the road of Calvary, and, like Veronica, who courageously offered a towel to dry the face of the Lord, to brave the prejudices and the opposition of the entourage and to approach and participate with all of our being in the holy sacrifice, we must recognize that believers themselves are fooled by current fashion, flight before suffering, frantic searching for pleasure, and end by renouncing the cross. One wishes a Christianity without a cross, which accommodates us with salvation in sweetness and without much effort. Is it not because of this sad state of things that our mother has manifested tears so many times? And what is going to happen if we continue to pass over the dangerous warnings, feigning indifference, despite the miracle of seeing tears flowing from a statue of wood? In the first chapter of St. Luke, one finds this impressive passage. While Zachary, who will be the father of John the Baptist, precursor of Jesus, is incensing the altar in the temple, the archangel Gabriel appears to announce that his wife Elizabeth is going to conceive a son. As he did not immediately believe, the angel declares, I have been sent to you to announce this good news, but you will no longer be able to speak until it happens. Indeed, you have not believed my words, which will be fulfilled on the fixed day. Sister Agnes did not become deaf because she doubted the words of the angel. Rather, her ears were cured, as the angel predicted, because she at once believed. It is important to note that God punishes Zachary for his lack of faith in the angel's word by sending a physical trial. Numerous famous examples show that God permits the direct intervention of angels when events of great importance are involved, as is the case here. The numerous manifestations of the angels and the miracles which took place at Yuzawadai are undeniable facts. Furthermore, God willed that not only angels but the Blessed Virgin herself appear in person to transmit her messages. And she did this in a poignant manner, weeping. When men on earth join in sobs and flowing tears to their laments, they find brethren to run to their aid, to loyally hear them. After so pathetic an appeal from their mother in heaven, how many times will it be necessary for men to become aware of the gravity of the moment and to make honorable amendment? Attach great importance to this day. Saturday, May 1st, 1976, was the feast of St. Joseph, patron of workers. 
On that day, we were awaiting 11 visitors coming from Tokyo, some men of advanced age, dwelling in a suburb west of Tokyo, for the most part, had formed a group which they called Anshinkai, with the purpose of deepening their faith, while at the same time carrying on their professional activities in society. I had transferred the Mass that day to the evening, so they would be able to participate and pray with the sisters. Thus, lauds had been followed by a time of adoration that morning, without Mass. After breakfast, Sister Agnes went to the chapel and saw that the tears were flowing again from the statue. The previous lacrimation had been one year and two months before, namely the 6th of March of the preceding year. Naturally, everyone went to the chapel and we recited a rosary. Then, when Sister Kay came about twenty after nine to, sm to make a sketch on drawing paper, she found, to her astonishment, that the tears had begun again and immediately informed all the others who again gathered to recite a rosary with her. I could not be present at this second lacrimation because I left to give some courses in the city. I was told about it when I returned a little before midday. A half hour before Vespers, which was scheduled for five o'clock in the afternoon, one of the sisters went to the chapel and again the statue was weeping. A third rosary was recited by the entire community. The group of visitors arrived later than expected, towards eight o'clock in the evening. We had been awaiting without eating because the mass had to precede the dinner, taking advantage of the holidays in the month of May. About 20 other persons were expected to arrive from Niigata, Sendai, and other regions. The Mass, which began at 8 o'clock, was said in honor of St. Joseph to thank him and to ask his protection. It ended about 9 o'clock. When everybody had left the holy place, I remarked that Sister Agnes remained alone, prostrate, without moving, since the end of her communion. A little later she came to find me with a paper grasped in her hand, the angel had appeared to her after communion. This is the text. Many men in this world afflict the Lord. Our Lady awaits souls to console him. Remain in poverty. Sanctify yourself and pray in reparation for the ingratitudes and the outrages of so many men. The rosary is your weapon. Say it with care and more often for the intention of the Pope, of bishops and priests. You must not forget these words of Mary. The Blessed Virgin prays continually for the conversion of the greatest possible number and weeps, hoping to lead to Jesus and to the Father, souls offered to them by her intercession. For this intention and to overcome exterior obstacles, achieve interior unity, form a single heart, let believers lead a life more worthy of believers, pray with a new heart, attach great importance to this day for the glory of God and of His Holy Mother. With courage, spread this devotion among the greatest number. Inform your superior and him who directs you of what I have told you. Saying this, the angel disappeared. After reading this, I went to dinner at the presbytery with the group of visitors. About 20 minutes of 10 in the evening, we were still at table and they were recording some of the happenings of their trip. They had traveled 700 kilometers by car. The telephone rang. It was a call from the convent. The statue of Mary was again weeping for the fourth time in the same day. Through the dark night, we all hastened to the chapel, and at the sight of the tears flowing from the eyes of the statue, some prostrated themselves, others sobbed, each manifesting his emotion in a different way. As on the other occasions, I took out my rosary, and we meditated on the sorrowful mysteries. During the recitation of the rosary, the tears continued to flow abundantly from both eyes, down the cheeks. The drops fell from the chin to the breast and even wet the pedestal. They finally stopped during the second decade. Among the visitors who had come to spend the night at the convent, beginning with the 20 persons who were not a part of the Tokyo group, it seems that certain ones had the suspicion that there was some kind of fakery inside the statue. The next day, the third Sunday of Easter, I cited the words of the angel quoted above during my sermon and it invited everyone present to reflect on the meaning of the tears shed by Our Lady. That day, there were still many more visitors, including four doctors. While we were dining in a warm and an animated ambiance, the same news of the previous evening came to cut short our conversations. It was about 12.30. Almost at once, the chapel was full. This time, even those who had not been, been able to repress suspicions the evening before began to weep and sob. The doctors present agreed that this could only be a prodigy. According to the records of the community, 
There were 55 eyewitnesses that day. The tears had flowed five times in two days, leaving for the first time visible traces even on the cheeks after the tears disappeared. They are still visible today, despite the time that has pa since passed. 